I model what I do and how I think after the biggest companies I can find, right? You, Amazon is a great example. But what they're doing is they're leveraging two things. They're leveraging their brand and their platform. But in my overall strategy, I'm buying a lot of properties and I'm creating a brand and infrastructure around it. So when I make an exit, now I'm selling it all. That's where there's real power. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Sergio Altamar. Sergio, after transitioning into real estate as a side business in 2012, he partnered with his wife, Corin, to start Hearthfire Holdings, a boutique real estate investment and property management company. Uh, we had his wife on the show uh, back in June of 2020, and we talked about leveraging technology to scale and starting a blind fund. Uh, but in just eight short years, Hearthfire Holdings has built a portfolio of more than $50 million in assets under management and syndicated over $12 million in assets, returning more than $2 million in profits and 25% IRR to investors. Sergio goes through her talking about going from syndicating small multifamily to moving into self-storage and why, even leaving his federal position, which is you know just as seen as a secure J-O-B, and why he would do that. But even, even working together with his wife and scaling, he's big into tech. Uh, and so I love hearing from guys like this who they have a tech background and then they come into real estate and, and they get to figure out all these things that are that just make our life easier. Um, I do not have a tech background, but I love how tech helps us to be more organized uh, and, and just streamline processes, right? So I love hearing from guys like this who are really good at that so we can improve as well. I know you are going to learn a lot about tech, but you're also going to learn about operating your fund. And just uh, vision and strategy, like through through acquisitions, I, I think it's it's helpful. Some of the things he talks about uh, when he, when they're acquiring a project and in looking long term at that project, uh, you're going to hear that today, and I think it's going to help you when you're looking at projects and you and you're thinking about your your overall vision for not just your business but for your investors as well, and in looking at different parts of that that specific deal. And does it fit that uh, for your overall vision for you and your investors, uh, even though it may hit a certain return metric, does it fit that overall vision and strategy uh, for you and your investors? So I know you're going to learn a lot from Sergio today. I know many of you are pursuing to be an active operator in real estate and commercial real estate, or you're a passive investor, one or the other. And today our guest, he's done it. He had that J-O-B that probably many would dream about having. Having. But you know what? He's now built an amazing business. He's syndicating deals. His business is growing, uh, just doing some big stuff. We're going to get into numerous things about his business, how he's grown. And I'll tell you, we also interviewed his wife back in June 17th of 2020. Uh, I would encourage you to go back and listen as well. We talked about leveraging technology uh, at that time and, and starting to build a blind fund. Maybe you are working on a blind fund at that time. But today we have Sergio. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Whitney. Excited to be here. Yeah, honored to have you on the show. Sergio, tell us, you know, I want to go back a little bit and then I want to get into, uh, you know, your strategy now and how, you know, these properties that you're doing, buying your team a little bit, those things. But give us a little bit about the real estate transition, you know, that we all like to hear about. Because I think it's encouraging, right? I hope the listeners, as they hear that, they are encouraged that, hey, I can do it too. They hear this every day on the show, right? But everybody's story is a little different. Everybody's got knocked back a little differently at different times. And every, all of us had to make that decision. Hey, we're going to get back up. We're going to keep going, right? Tell us a little bit about how you did that. My real estate journey initially started back in 2007 when working on a house hack and bought a duplex and it failed miserably. I won't get into all the details there. That was I talked a lot about that. And actually, that was a good part of the bigger pockets uh, conversation I had. But we ended up met my wife in 2012 and, and she was on the same journey of house hacking. She had a day job. I had a day job. We met through work. I worked for the Federal Reserve for 22 years. I was in IT through her her and her parents, she was buying a triplex, lived in one unit, ran out the others. I mean, great story. And this was in the city of Philadelphia. And she's originally from Los Angeles. I connected her with uh, realtors and different contacts that I had in my network to help her find that property, find that property, uh, needed some work. We spent our nights and weekends getting dirty and renovating it. I was always pretty handy. So at that time, we were like many people getting started in, re started in real estate and just doing your own work. Liked it. Initially, almost immediately, I started implementing property management software because for me, 
I'm an IT guy. And so naturally having technology to support the business made sense. Started to do that. If I had an IT background, that would be so helpful. <laughs> and that's like, it's kind of one of those unfair advantages for me. And we'll talk about like when we got into self-storage, how it really comes into play. So bought a triplex together the following year. And, and our story is interesting. So we started dating, we started doing construction and a lot of our dates were doing construction. And then we bought a, another triplex. We started our syndication business when we had more deals than we had access to capital at that time. Uh, and these were small multifamily deals. So we started a business then, you know, got incorporated LLC, the whole bit, a uh, logo. And immediately I just always wanted to brand and, and take things. I've, I've always been, if you're going to do something, do it right. You don't start. I never was going to start with spreadsheets and do things uh, half-assed, if you will. So from there, we started syndicating and then we bought a house together and then we got married. So the whole sequence of events is very unconventional. So we started syndicating the small multifamily stuff. We were both working full-time day jobs. Me and IT, I did everything from tech support, network engineering, security, project management, you name it. And I was work, I was still very much a career person. This was still like a kind of a side hustle. My wife as well, she was an IT project manager also for the Fed. And you know, that's where we met. And as things started to grow, when we started syndicating these other deals, it wasn't a big deal. I mean, it was, these were a lot of full gut rehab. So there were newer construction and we were buying them essentially at C of O and we were growing this. And next thing you know, uh, Curran's parents were selling properties and buying out in California and buying properties near where we lived. And we started assuming management. So now I had a management company. We were managing these syndication deals. So next thing you know, I have like 50 units under management and again, we're still working full time. And at that time we didn't have any kids. And and got married in 2017. And through the course of all this, we just kept going. There wasn't like, I wasn't keeping score and, and keeping track of all this, but we knew that we were starting to get stretched a little thin. Corinne quit the day job actually before that. She quit in 2016 to go at it full time. In 2017, our, in March, our daughter was born, Stella, love of my life. And it was at that time when we realized that having a day job, a night job for me, I mean, Corinne had quit the day job and then and having a daughter on top of all that was not sustainable. So I had to make, you know, a choice. I had got to the level of executive at the Fed and had the job security, the benefits, the whole bit. So we said, okay, well, what are we going to do? And it was a pretty easy answer. We were going to go all in on the business. So we wanted to go in all in the business and I'm, I'm very big on strategy. So I'm not like throwing things on paper and some, you know, some crazy goals, but it was a matter of, all right, what is the game plan to get us there? And, and my transition plan was making sure that I had enough of of a runway in money and taking advantage of the fact that I did have a W-2 job so I can get better leverage, right? And taking advantage of that. So we refinanced a couple of our triplexes, pulled out some cash. I had in my bank account because I needed to make sure that, all right, if I stop this and it doesn't work, I got to be able to pay bills. So that is essentially what bridged the gap. I knew that I could sleep at night because I didn't need all this extra income. Quit the day job. For a while anyway. Well, for a while, right? And so even to this day, I still don't get a, a quote unquote paycheck. I'm able to just leverage, you know, capital events and windfalls that way. So 2000 and... 17, I quit the day job. 2018 was, we went through a rebranding exercise. Initially, I created the website, the logo. We did that together. And it was, it was, it was pretty cheesy, right? It was, it looked like, you know, it's like when you build your own website, you know, even if you do it on Wix or whatever, you could tell some, you built your own website. So we said, all right, well, if we're going to do this, got to take it seriously. There was two pieces of it. There was a rebranding to look professional. And then there was, how do we take the next step up, which is larger commercial properties. At that time we were going into, it was middle. 2018, uh, probably earlier. And I was looking at larger multifamily properties. I did all my underwriting at the time. When I looked at these deals that I was looking at and my underwriting, which is very conservative, I couldn't make any numbers work. I said, compared to what, in hindsight, by today's standards, they would have very well worked, right? At that time, I was looking for, you know, 25% IRR and, you know, stupid things. So, and I said, all right, from all my years working at the Fed, I knew there was an economic downturn happening. Didn't know why. We were just 10 years in a growth cycle. And it, that's just the way it works. So I said, all right, well, if we're going to have a recession, I, at that time we was predicting that 
multifamily was not the way to go, what other asset classes should we look at? As I did research and learned through bigger pockets and books and whatever, it was self storage. So I landed on self storage. Actually, mobile home parks was was another one. Having had the the amount of experience I had in multifamily and tenant management, I wasn't sure I'd be able to work with mobile home park tenants at that time. So landed on self storage. As I got into learning about the business of self storage, it's very much technology driven. So our first property we eventually landed, and there were some offers made and trying to get in good with some commercial brokers because you. That's a big part of it is them taking you seriously that you can close. We landed on our first self-storage facility in 2019, literally had to operate it ourselves when we couldn't hire right. And we decided to let's just do it ourselves. Back and forth at the facility was about an hour and a half from our house. Ended up uh, buying an RV to be able to manage this. So we ended up staying in the RV. That's commitment right there. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, that was like, you got to do whatever you got to do. I'm not going to lose. I mean, we have friends, families, money that invest with us. I'm not going to lose somebody's money. So we did. We bought the property in 2019. 2020 happens and you know that's that mulligan in life right with covid and everything throughout that process we realized that in order to grow and scale we needed more help we needed a team so we started to look at all right who can i get for operations who can i get on acquisition side so we started to create uh, allegiances with individuals that had that expertise 2020 was a year that eventually we launched our first fund we acquired through that fund end of 2020 early 2021 is when we actually closed three storage facilities. Then throughout the year, we ended up acquiring another pen. And now we're just in hyper growth mode. We've just been working on assembling the right team. Our business strategy now has has transitioned into looking at things in not in isolation, but as part of an overall strategy. So I know that we're going to dive into a lot of that. That's kind of how I got to this table. No, that's awesome. Sergio, I wanted to back up. There's numerous points that you listed there and, and we'll spend a ton of time on this, but you mentioned syndicating like small multifamily. Were you all syndicating? Uh, like what size when you say small, what were those? Uh, in some cases, the smallest was a duplex. Wow. Okay. And it was just basically bringing in three other partners. It, it was set up with a GP LP. I mean, it was set up as we spent the legal fees and everything to do it and do it right. And yeah, I mean, in hindsight, the overhead of putting all that was expensive, but that's how we had to learn. Wow. No, that's incredible. I, I just wonder because I get that question often, right? It's like, well, when, what's too small or what's too, when do I start needing to syndicate? And, and I tell people, it's not so much the deal size at all. <laughs> it's about where this money's coming from and the expectations behind that money. And is this person active in the deal or not? And, you know, those things that, obviously consult with an attorney. I'm not an attorney, but I'm just telling you, you need to ask your attorney. Well, absolutely. And I think it's experience. It's one thing to read something in a book and it's another thing to go through the process, right? So the process that I went through was looking at a deal, underwriting the deal, putting together marketing materials. I mean, even though it was people that I knew, we weren't just talking about it over a bar, at a bar. It was presentations, making that strategy evident and then taking investor dollars as little as five, $7,000. You have to have a track record starting from zero and trying to raise three, $5 million. You may do it if you have a big enough wallet can support something like that. But generally speaking, yeah, I got to ask yourself, do you invest with you? That's a good question right there. Would you invest with you? I think that's a good question to ask. Like when you put together all your materials, right? And you're, you're about to present it to your investors and like, look at it as somebody seeing you for the first time, right? Exactly. Like, would you invest in this project? That is a great question to ask. Well, I want to jump to though, you and your wife, you, you know, working together, you're, you're looking to scale the business. Speak to that part of the growth trajectory a little bit and how you all are working together, how, what that looked like, how you all started to scale. And a lot of it is I've learned a lot over the years and, and GoBundance has been instrumental in that. And that is reading the right books to, you can read like a self-storage book to learn the self-storage business, but it doesn't teach you business itself. Uh, so reading books like Who Not How, the E-Myth, and E-Myth have really resonated with me because I was a technician and that's that's what I was doing. And we knew that we were getting stretched thin. You can only wear so many, all of the hats for so long. And even though it was two of us, that was good, but you you eventually reach the point where you know it's too much. And I don't know if it's an innate feeling or just crap is just falling all over the place and you just feel overwhelmed, but it becomes pretty obvious. We reached that threshold probably at a higher level than others, but I worked on systems throughout, right? Whether it was a property management business or syndication business, everything that I do, and this is from my IT background, if you know that there's a chance you're going to do something more than once, it's in your best interest to work through the entire process, perfect the process, document it, and then try to automate it. What is Agent Ignite? 
Are you wondering how you can make more money and create a competitive advantage for yourself and your clients in this ever competitive real estate industry? Agent Ignite is the key to furthering your knowledge, establishing your expertise, and positioning yourself as a go-to expert. They deliver new and relevant knowledge so you can expand your clientele, close more deals, and ultimately increase income. Each month features a new guest speaker who will deliver on what is most relevant for your business. As a member of DMAR's Market Trends Committee, an avid champion for building wealth through real estate, and a self-proclaimed data geek, Nicole will share market trends and commentary that will add value to you and your clients. Staying up to date on industry statistics coupled with niche topics delivered by industry experts will help you motivate your buyers and sellers and make you more money. Sign up for the next Agent Ignite session at theruthteam.com slash events. Love that. You, you can't improve it if you don't document it, typically, right? Uh, and more times than not in our business, we do repeat processes and tasks, I mean, nearly daily for many things, or, or just the process of getting a deal closed, right? Or process of raising money or process of how we communicate with investors or all those things. Man, I just stress to my team all the time. It's this constant battle of improvement, right? Hey, we found a problem. Write that down. Like, how are we going to do it next time, right? To, so that doesn't happen again. I like to say when I was in, a lot of this training correlates to what I did in I. IT. And I always tell people, your job is to train your successor. And if you do that well, right, give yourself a promotion. If you're going to give yourself a promotion, how do you pass your job on to somebody else? And that ideally, without sitting with them and, you know, training or whatever, just look at the models of any large company and a franchise, for example, there's a operating manual and you could be tr you could trade a monkey to do some of these things. So the idea there is to continue to create those systems, processes and workflows and you keep creating more capacity because when you don't have to think about things over and over again, so many people just keep reinventing the wheel when it comes to it. And it could be something as simple as maybe simple, but some people I see that when they're doing their own underwriting, they're creating a spreadsheet each and every time, right? Just buy a damn template and use it and so you can be able to do it. And that's that's how you scale. Learn it inside and out, right? And then you're going to start making small modifications that are going to help you. On that note, you're talking about processes and especially with your background in tech, I would love to know like what tech do you use to automate those processes or document those processes? What have been your favorite tools to make that happen? The number of tools that I've implemented, used and abandoned over the years is that the list is really long. Right now, when it comes to self-storage, there's our tools that we use, say, pre-acquisition. And some of it is rudimentary, like a spreadsheet and tracking which deals we want to look at and, and what is our buying criteria relative to those deals. And so I could put a property on that spreadsheet and choose a yes, no box if this is, you know, is there expansion capability on this particular facility? So it starts there. Next level is having models for the underwriting. Some of the handoff parts of it, there's still some manual stuff. Then we use tools like Notion. I don't know if you're familiar with Notion. Notion has been so far to me, like the nirvana of tools, Notion.so is, is really what it comes from. It's kind of like a Evernote, OneNote. It's a lot of different tools that are that have come together over the years. It's not a trivial tool. I mean, it's got a database background, but it's good for me. I mean, some guys on my team kind of uh, rebel against it, but it allows for organizing a lot of the pieces of a acquisition or, or project in a single interface, right? You end up with documents on Google Drive, Excel, whatever. So it starts there. And then when we get into, uh, you know, we use that for our acquisition checklist and due diligence and being able to import documents right into each task, right? So review utility bills, right? And you can import the utility bills. So at any given time, I can do a search in the interface and find what I'm looking for. So it's about speed during the course of business. Then you get into the tools around operating the facility. And we've got technology, everything from our website to where someone can browse and inquire about and reserve and move into a storage unit, right? Electronic signature. So you could find and reserve, and this is not new, right? We didn't invent any of this. Reserve and move into a storage unit all without talking to me or anybody. And then we, I'm a big believer in integration. I mean, not that I'm a believer, it's, it's kind 
common sense, right? So I, if I'm looking at multiple tools to support a process, how do they integrate to make sure that my Google platform and my calendar synchronizes with this other tool? There's not redundant information and it's where it needs to be with depending on what you're using. So what about uh, CRM or task management, those things specifically? I think like not everyone's self-storage, you know, into self-storage is listening, but, but however, I would encourage everyone listening to have some kind of CRM, right? Some way that you're managing your contacts. There's many free ones that are even good to start out with. What's been your choice of CRMs and, and even like task management? On that note, we use Asana for lots of things personally. Our entire team does. But, you know, there's Asana, there's Monday.com, there's Trello, there's all these things. Do you use any of those? Notion replaces all those. So Notion, that is that when I say the Nirvana, it captures the essence of a lot. of. So it's actually like template driven. So you could have a CRM template. You could have a budget template. You could have a checklist template. You can do a lot of things within the platform. We were the same way. And a lot of times, this goes back even to my days at the Fed, every tool has its optimal use and set of capabilities. And when you try to use a tool for what it's not designed to do, you tend to say, okay, well, this tool isn't working. Let me find another tool. You got to use the tools for what they're intended for. So when it comes to like CRM, I mean, you can, depending on it, like we have multiple CRMs, right? Is it a, is it an investor? Is it a client, a customer that's looking for a storage facility? And some platforms have a CRM component built in. Others will use like, like a pipe drive, you know, something like that. There's a lot of options. And the best tool, I would say is the one you're going to use. That is it. That's so true. If, if you don't use it, it's useless. It doesn't matter. And I would agree with what you just said completely. Uh, and I'll give a shout out to my friends at Invest Next. Uh, they are our investor portal. I've used them for a couple, few years now and just amazing customer service. I encourage you to look them out, talk to Kevin or email me and I'll introduce you to those guys personally. It's been a great investor portal, right? Uh, you know, where they can log in securely, they can see the deals, they can see the growth, they can see their distributions, they can put in their banking information. All that stuff lives there. However, you know, with my presence online and with my podcast, with all these things, I would say the CRM component of that is not robust enough for, for what I need. For most operators, it may be just fine, right? You know, so we have, we use HubSpot, which, you know, is a very high end, a very expensive CRM, you know, for that side of it, because there's so many options. It's so robust on that side. But however, it does not have an investor portal, right? So two different things. And I want to jump to, you know, your syndication business a little bit. And, you know, tell us though, a little bit about what, what's been the hardest part of this just syndication journey or process for you, say over the last couple of years, if you started growing the, as you have started growing the self-storage, com, you know, facility business, what's been some of the, uh, maybe a setback that we could all learn from? I think the biggest thing that I've had to learn is how to scale responsibly. And what, what I mean by that is, yeah, I could syndicate my wife and I a deal per year, two deals and, and whatever. But as like, I mean, with the syndication business, you're not, things are coming on, they're not always coming off at that pace, right? Once you get to say five years, then there's probably that, then there's that churn, property's coming on and off, right? And then, so it's about managing scale. And to me, what I've learned about business is there's a big difference between having a job that you consider being self-employed versus a business that is scalable. You, you There's essentially three stages. You got yourself a job, you try to grow and you fail and you go backwards. And we see that with like in real estate a lot as well. Or you find a way to break through that plateau and get to scale. And that's the hardest part because it requires a different skill set. That's EMIF, right? Right? That's where you, you're not just a technician that now you have a business. And for me, there's been a couple pieces. One is finding the right people to bring in as partners. You know, some are salary, some are actual equity partners, finding the right people that are going to complement skills that I have, and then elevating myself to being a more visionary strategist and not in the day to day. And that's when I transition into being a leader and, and true visionary. So getting the money equation right. And I'm learning through a lot of pain, the difference between, say, a bookkeeper versus a controller versus a CFO and a CPA, for that matter. And you talk about money, those are, those are the roles. And I've even seen, even through some go abundance conversations, that you're looking, keep blaming the bookkeeper for issues that is not really a bookkeeper responsibility. You can't get a hold of, I can't do forecasting, I can't do budgeting. Well, that's not a bookkeeper's role. Bookkeepers, accounts payable, accounts receivable, maintaining the books. A controller is more responsible for some of that. And then a CFO is more big picture, whatever. And I've had to learn the hard way how to get more, how to marry the 
sophistication of money management responsibly with the growth of my business. I can't spend my time looking at P&Ls. Every acquisition is a new business. I mean, my taxes are, it's a ream of paper now. When you get to that level, trying to track that, and then you keep blaming the wrong people, getting there, right? And so to me, it's, it's identifying those key roles. There's a reason why most companies, when you look at the top of the chart, it's CEO, CFO, COO, and so on and so forth. And that's why you got to get those roles right. That's been the hardest thing just to get the scale. And I, I mean, we now believe we have all of the right pieces in place. And then when you get all those right pieces, then you just throw gas on the fire. And that's when you could just keep ramping things up. It's incredible. It's almost like some growing pains there as well, right? But it's a growth that we're all going to go through. If you're going to scale your business, you cannot do everything forever, right? Uh, you do have all those hats in the beginning, of course. But as you scale, as you're talking about, those things change. And you're going to find those people who are better at those specific things than you are. And then you said, I love how you said it. You know, now you're just going to throw gas on the fire because you've built this engine that can withstand it, right? It's not just you doing all these things now. But on that note, you know, like you talked about now being the visionary, you know, strategy and just the acquisitions. And, you know, you and I briefly mentioned this before we started talking, but I thought you could speak to it now just about how you all look at a deal. And I liked how you said that you're not looking at the deal just individually, but you're, you're thinking strategy and overall strategy for the business and for you all and for your investors. Just speak to that a little bit. Because I, th- I thought that was a great point. Self-storage is, is unique and w- in which it allows to evaluate it at a higher level. And so when you're looking at different asset classes, in many cases, you're evaluating a property and evaluating income and expenses, cash flow, and then cap rates, whatever. When it comes to self-storage and anything that you can get economies of scale from, I love that, right? So with self-storage, as I scale, the same resources can be leveraged across the properties. Brand web infrastructure, the same website for that matter. You just choose a drop down. Which location do you want to buy from, right? So my thought process is I model what I do and how I think after the biggest companies I can find. Amazon is a great example, right? So you look at Amazon, it started with books and whatever. But what they're doing is they're leveraging two things. They're leveraging their brand and their platform. My goal, and this is across all of Hearthfire Holdings, all of our Hearthfire property management, we even started an RV rental business. It's brand power, which we know through marketing and studying that. And then it, from an individual property standpoint, how do they? How does one fit into the overall strategy? So as I'm buying a, a property, I'm able to look at it individually because you have to, right? Worst case scenario is I got to buy, you know, I'm going to buy this one property. I may have to sell it. But in my overall strategy, I'm buying a lot of properties and I'm creating a brand and infrastructure around it. So when I make an exit, now I'm selling it all, right? I mean, that's where there's real power. And so I look at every property and even like as we're talking, Talking right now, we have a portfolio and there's some properties at certain sizes, some with CapEx projects, some with expansions, some of whatever. So I can also manage portfolio risk, right? So now we get into more advanced private equity strategies, right? It's kind of your mutual fund. It's your 401k to balance risk and return. So I get to do all that. There's two pieces of it, right? There's us as an equity, as a private company and looking at it from a principal and partner standpoint in our company. And then from an investor standpoint, because I got to look at it from there as well. I want to make sure that if I'm promising returns that, yeah, you may invest in one deal, but you're going to get the benefits of all the other deals that we did because it all fits together, even even down to the employee. Now, I could share one employee across multiple facilities in their same proximity. I leverage the same infrastructure, the call center, whatever. That's ultimate leverage. So everything is about leveraging up. Love that. I love just the thinking about it as an overall strategy but for you all and for your investors and not just as an individual deal you know does this deal work and I love even thinking through things like that like what are the resources you have that make this not only a great deal just say you know under on the underwriting for you as a business right hey we can leverage these other things here so it's better for us you know something that's maybe 50 miles away right even you know the exact same project so it's just great to think that way I think as we're all looking at new projects all the time and thinking about our team having our team and our investors in mind Um, so knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself, say, four or five years ago, you know, about getting into the real estate business or growing or the asset class or what, anything you would do different or, you know, that you would say, hey, Sergio, you need to look at this. For sure. I don't believe in like, can't change the past because you don't know what the, what the result was there. Right. But if I were, what really was a turning point was uh, reading books like Who Not How and really less focused, I wouldn't say less, but 
I continued to focus on the technical aspects of, say, the asset class versus how do I scale the business? That's where power of partnerships. And in some cases, people think of it as I need to pay somebody X amount of dollars and I can't afford to pay X amount of dollars. Well, find a partner, right? Find a partner that's in a similar stage of growth in life and whatever, and being, you can be able to trust. I mean, it happens all the time. You look at pick, you know, whether it's Microsoft, Apple, these are all started with different partnerships. And in some cases, maybe there was one guy up top, but the people, the core was those key individuals. So I would have certainly started looking at partnerships and focused more on business growth and business sophistication and operating it as a more advanced business and growth business. And then finding the right partners and started learning more about leadership soon. Because now my focus is very much on leadership, uh, team dynamics and, and all that, because as you add more resources, when you're not doing it all yourself, somebody else is, and you got a lot of moving parts. And so now it's like trying to wrangle all that. And in some cases, I'm learning on the fly. That is something I would have focused on a lot earlier. So it sounds like having a bigger mindset from the very beginning for the business, right? Even your role specifically. And like we said, you do obviously wear a ton of hats in the beginning, and it's hard to do all those things and do them all well. However, and maybe some thinking, thinking bigger in the beginning, maybe that would help change some direction uh, at times. Yes, you can't change the past. However, we can learn from it, right? We can learn from each other and, and each other, what each of us have, has done in the past. So what about any predictions for you, uh, you know, as far as just the real estate market over the next six to 12 months? Uh, are you all buying, selling or neither or you expect something mass major to happen. I know you, nobody has a crystal ball, but just what are you, know, what are you thinking is going to happen? So I've got a unique perspective in that I worked for the Federal Reserve System for 22 years. And that gave me, even though I was in IT, I supported every business line. And so I had a unique view of economic cycles, monetary policy, and all of that. We're in unprecedented time uh, because of COVID. There's never been a time where the entire world shut down for any given period of time. And we're still dealing with, you know, whether it's lockdowns, restrictions, you know, mandates, whatever it is that is affecting supply chains, wages, uh, there's great resignation. So there's a lot of factors right now to consider. I'm a personal believer that the market has really gotten addicted to stimulus and the, the Fed has talked about raising interest rates and, and I think they can and will. I wouldn't look at it and say, hey, interest rates are going to go through the roof. Let me buy everything now. I don't think that's, we're never going to see that. I'm even anything, anything remotely to double digit interest rates on, at least on real estate side. So I'd be less concerned there. Still curious about it. I think in the housing sector, uh, multifamily is where was, to me, was not an asset class that I was ultra bullish on or, or bullish at all on or positive for that matter during COVID. We're seeing the interest in renting continuing to grow up and, and home ownership shifting, right? There's some dynamics. I mean, COVID allowed people to work remotely. So people are, you know, in more suburban areas, there's a lot of growth there. I think there are, you got to look at it from a macroeconomic and microeconomic standpoint and regional. So depending on where you're at, there might be Amazons of the world coming in. Different asset classes are going to perform differently. As a whole, I, I mean, real estate is always going to be the best asset class or best investment for, for wealth. To me, I, any investment is better than no investment, obviously without overextending it, whatever. Self-storage, we love. Uh, we're very bullish on self-storage for for, for obvious reasons. I mean, COVID did nothing but further fuel it. Uh, we're seeing people making offices out of their houses, classrooms out of their houses. And so they got to move stuff around. And and now people have gotten used to being at home more. So now they're treating, remodeling and doing different things. And so self-storage has a big role in all that. Whether it's businesses uh, for inventory, you're are parking for different commercial vehicles. So very bullish on that asset class. There's even, I think, some opportunities in repurposing different things. Like I think the office sector is going to come back in some form or another. We're seeing closed down Kmart's converted into self-storage. I've seen numerous of those myself. We're seeing malls turned into regional retail meccas anchored by apartment communities. So there's, I would look at it from a synergy of asset classes as well, where there is one asset class, now you add on another. So so we're considering all that. I'm, I'm still, I still love real estate. I think it's still uh, 
Uh, I'm afraid of regulation. From a housing standpoint, landlords are a target, um, especially in big cities. I can't stand it. They're making it really, really difficult. So you got to watch for some of that. We have just a few minutes left. So just a couple final questions. Maybe you could spend a minute. Uh, I know this is it's a big question, but I want you to spend just a little bit of time at least. Uh, how do you prepare for that downturn? What does that look like uh, You know, for you all when you're pursuing that next opportunity? The way that I look at it is I love diversification. Me personally, as I've been diversifying my family through all kinds of investments. I invest in other passive investment deals. I bought into a green coffee company, bought into Detrapel chemical company. I'm big into crypto. I'm, I'm an investor by nature, right? So I love to invest in everything. I'm not a real estate guy, right? That's that's what I do. And I mean, I love real estate. I mean, that's the most secure way of uh, securing you know, wealth, building and growing and securing wealth. To me, it's about diversifying. Even within an asset class, that's the best thing that you can do to, you don't prepare for a market downturn, you just hedge against it, right? And this way, whichever way the market goes, you're prepared. I mean, that's the best way to, I would describe it. What are a couple of daily habits you're disciplined about that have helped you achieve success? First and foremost is my meditation practice, right? My meditation practice is about, and I was just recording one, another podcast and talking, we talked about this in, in depth. And to me, that is, you know, when you think re- big popular books in real estate, even though it's not a real estate book, is like Think and Grow Rich, right? So applying concepts of using your mind to achieve goals is very important. Meditation to me is not just sitting still and quiet. It is being present in the given moment, being aware of what I'm doing, how I'm feeling, and being able to, once you get good at, I've been meditating for like 20 years and big, you know, I've got all the cushions, the altar, I'm a big believer in, I've read all the books, not just spiritually, it's a physiological piece of it as well. And it's basically conditioning two things, your breath and your awareness. And it's something that you carry throughout the day. And through understanding and growing that practice, now I can literally, and some people may think I'm nuts, but I am literally manifesting whatever I want. And and if I'm something is going astray, I meditate on the opposite and I will find that I'm literally adjusting my frequency and going there. That's like, that's the same concept of being around people that'll help you grow. That's the number one practice. I mean, I go through the m- miracle morning practice, big into reading, audio books, but just anything self-improvement, I'm a, I'm a junkie for it. How do you like to give back? Uh, so giving back, I like to use giving back as a self accountability in in areas of life that I want to say we don't pay as much attention to. It's easy to be focused on your business, money and all that, right? That's an area of life that we're always going to spend a lot of time on, whether it's sports, as kids, whatever. It is the areas that support you as a person and human being. For me, it's my my family, my wife and my daughter. We are through GoBundance, we host FanBundance, which is the family event that we have that we host and we're really going big on that. I'm a uh, the leader of the Go Dads micro tribe. We're active in in church, every charity that I believe in contributing. So I'm about I, I like to give where I can directly see, feel and see results. So whatever it is, I mean we're we're very big into that and, and giving back, I mean the number one rule of receiving is you have to give. Sergio, it's been a pleasure to meet you in person. I, I love doing interviews in person when I can. I think it's a, di- a very different vibe. Uh, uh, it's been an honor to be here at Go Abundance, uh, you know, with you and and just an amazing group here. Just thank you for being transparent, sharing about your your path, right? To I mean, leaving the what twenty two year you know with the Fed uh, uh, career to uh, to. Uh, real estate, right? Uh, you know, and then and not just like doing the small thing to have some kind of passive income on the side, but no, you're like, you've built a business, you've built a brand, you're building a team, you're thinking bigger, you're building strategy and vision and just going into that today, grateful uh, for that. Uh, tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Yeah. So the easiest way is investwithsergio.com. Uh, that takes you to uh, our Hearthfire Capital site. There's a sign up and subscribe to mailing list. Pivotalcoaching.co recently launched a, uh, a coaching to be able to give back that way, provide coaching programs, personal group coaching through LinkedIn. Just look me up that way. Any one of those will get you to the gateway of our companies. Thank you, Sergio. Hope you have a blessed day. Thank you, Whitney. Appreciate it. Been a lot of fun. Thank you for being a loyal listener of the show. Please subscribe and share it with your friends. We want to help you become the passive investor you've always wanted to become, but also the operator you've always wanted to become.
We want to be the number one resource for your real estate investing journey. But go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing in real estate today. 